Maya got the extended uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about my ongoing project, uh, which I'm, I'm an evolutionary ecologist, so and I'm still finding the, the task of working with this extremely complicated 3D data a bit daunting. Uh, so I'm going to talk like my very non-silly approach to get the data out. Um, uh, and the project broadly looks into the evolution of sensory traits uh, in general. Uh, uh, so I think some of us, have, all of us are actually quite interested in biology in general, uh, but I believe anyone who is remotely interested in evolutionary biology is extremely interested in understanding this wide variety of variation you see in life forms, in weird morphology, bizarre behaviors, right? Uh, and often one of the goal is to understand what are the drivers uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this diversity in the phenotypes. Uh, or the behaviors, or, or, or the phenotype which combines so many uh, things we see together. Uh, and often, uh, one of the major drivers uh, that comes across is, is habitat. I'm overly simplifying here, uh, but if you if you kind of look, the habitat either has a very direct or an indirect effect uh, on, on phenotypic evolution. Uh, and Kim Southwood kind of wrote this very uh, classic paper uh, in 1979, uh, where he even, even kind of generalizes saying, can habitat act as kind of an ecological template uh, for life history evolution in general, or phenotypic evolution uh, in general. Uh, and its habitat is interesting because like, uh, the no light environment varies, uh, especially when we talk about the sensory traits, or, or it can, or it can uh, uh, affect so many physical uh, and biological properties that, that can have a big impact uh, on phenotypic evolution. Uh, and, and that, uh, uh, the sensory traits are, are particularly quite interesting because uh, apart from brain, uh, sensory traits can be one of the most uh, uh, costly tissues to invest into because it needs a lot of neurons and a lot of uh, neurological processing. Uh, so you should invest in those traits only if you require them uh, or to keep like bare minimum. Uh, and it's well known that habitat can have quite strong impact on sensory traits, uh, for example, say eyes. Uh, but sensory traits can also uh, can restrict what habitat you find in. But I think the disentangling those correlation and causation is quite difficult. Uh, and this was this really nice study that came out recently, uh, which kind of tracked these birds by putting uh, uh, tags on them, and they were looking into where they go, where they don't go, uh, and they actually found quite uh, uh, a strong correlation between eye size and where the species actually breed uh, uh, and breed. So we wanted to extend this sort of. Of, of this hypothesis, which have been tested uh, quite often in vertebrates, actually, and there is a good correlation between habitat and eye size, uh, but we don't know much about what's happening uh, uh, in insects, actually. Uh, uh, dial activity, uh, that is whether you are a day flyer, night flyer, or you're a crepuscular, can have really big uh, impact on your uh, eye anatomy. For example, say in insects, you can have this, I'm very simplifying again this, but you can have, say, the night flies have a superposition type of eyes, and the day flies have a position type of eyes. I'm not going exactly into the, what anatomy does there. Uh, but within this diurnal lineages, uh, species can, we can, if we can say broadly, many of them you can find in open or closed habitats. Uh, and if we kind of extend this vertebrate hypothesis to the invertebrates, then you could say uh, the species occurring in closed or forest environments should have more large eyes, while those in the open uh, environment should have uh, uh, smaller eyes. Uh, uh, and we wanted to test it using uh, butterflies um, as uh, as the models, uh, and until now, I think we have heard how complicated uh, the data can be, especially with the three D data. And we saw the skulls, the three D uh, complex three D shapes, uh, and and it's quite a challenge to kind of quantify uh, uh, the exact phenotypic diversity, right? Uh, and I think with the eyes as well, it's kind of complicated because these are not very flat uh, uh, kind kind of structures. They are kind of they are a bit concave. Uh, um, and, and, and people have been coming up with various ways to kind of uh, quantify the exact shape of the eyes. And it gets even more complicated uh, because the insects especially have this face arch, right? Uh, individual omitidia, which act as this light capturing device. Uh, and that adds this another added complication uh, because you need to get really high resolution, like synchrotone level images to actually capture uh, that type of number uh, and to quantify that. So we have a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of challenges in actually uh, capturing uh, the actual uh, phenotypic diversity. Uh, and people have been using mostly linear measurements uh, until now at least to, um, uh, or, or if you wanna do like a broad macroevolutionary study, people have been using linear measurements and we don't know how well this linear measurement sort of translate uh, to actual uh, uh, 3D uh, uh, measurements. You know? For example, this is like a very old paper in 
butterfly, which is like a very recent one in fireflies, and of course Rosofla, uh, where they are also used more, more to be based in industry, uh, quantified investment in eyes or sensory traits in general. Uh, so the goal uh, uh, of this project uh, is to kind of look into more tempo and drivers of evolution of eye size uh, 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 using uh, phylogenetic comparative methods. But to do that, I need uh, uh, the actual numbers to actually run the analysis. Right? Uh, so I was confident about this part, but I wasn't confident about that part. So uh, it was kind of a kind of a big hole in the middle, which I wanted to transition from to here to there, and that was uh, quite challenging. Uh, so we adopted. Uh, we thought we would do uh, micro CT scanning of these butterflies to actually capture the entire uh, 3D uh, surface area of the eyes. So uh, we focusing on uh, European butterflies uh, because it's much easier to get the data on, uh, and we can do also because it's a lot of ecology uh, we know of, and we can use them uh, to actually see if they predict eye size now. Uh, I believe we got a good representation across uh, five different families, and also there's a good depth uh, in terms of the evolutionary history uh, they could pick up on. Uh, and we use all museum specimens uh, to do this. Uh, and then, uh, as I said before, we are, I use uh, uh, micro CT scanning uh, uh, to actually capture the data. So we have 59 species and around 470 individuals. Uh, I do no post processing uh, processing of the tissue whatsoever. So these are basically dried specimens. And then, as you can see here, we put them directly uh, on the scanner uh, and, you know, and get the uh, and get the scans. Uh, the problem is with the uh, is with the uh, the needle. You can see it's like right here, right, and it creates like so much of noise when you actually want to get the data out. So uh, it's not a very clean data as well. Um, but then, with the museum specimens, we can't do anything with them. So you got to have that thing, or else you're going to destroy the specimen. Uh, so, and for each of the individual, uh, we got like a high resolution head scan uh, uh, around like six to eight microns uh, and we also have the whole body scans uh, uh, for each of these individuals and whenever possible we try to get like four males and four females for each of uh, these species so we can also uh, look at a bit of a sexual dimorphism uh, so yeah so this was a lot to uh, work with uh, but anyway, so this is my very non-CV pipeline, uh, and I hope I'll get some ideas on what to do uh, after this workshop, hopefully. Anyway, so we get the scan. This is how the raw scan looks like in either X, Y, uh, uh, Z plane. Um, so now this is the tricky part, because I, I want to get my uh, the cornea, or the outer eye surface area out, right? And there is no way I can only segment out the cornea. So what I need to do is I, I kind of segment the whole head out because uh, the density is more or less similar with the tissues because they are all dried, so I don't get good enough contrast. So if I use, say, a simple threshold, uh, then I, I just segment the whole head out. And then what I do is I place this sort of landmarks. So these are not like homologous landmarks or whatever. I just need to define the boundary of the what eye looks like. I do that, and then uh, and then the program, I use a 3D slicer, and the slicer morphs is plug in. It kind of cuts out this part, so I kind of get this replica of the what the uh, eye surface area looks like, right? Uh, so it's kind of a bit roundabout way to get it. Um, and then I was trying out with some things. For example, I talk a bit about biomedicine. I want to use it, but then, anyways, uh, so all of this process took like almost more than one year, uh, and I had to be a postdoc. So panic was there that I need to get my data out and do something. So it's like, okay, I had some help uh, for analyzing this um, this data. So it's like. Right. Uh, just wanted to get the numbers out uh, so that I have something to do, and then I could play around with more CV methods uh, after that. Anyway, so uh, so this is what the pipeline looked like in general, and then I'll briefly go through some of the results. Uh, 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 anyway, so just very general. I don't want to go too much into the details. So you see strong elementary relationship, which is not very surprising. Uh, uh, there's this one group which kind of sticks out a bit. Uh, uh, also weird because uh, these are called the skippers and they they have these moth-like eyes and not butterfly eye like so they're kind of kind of I don't know I call them like a physiological outliers. Uh, and you can also fit sex specific. You see males uh, have usually larger eyes compared to the females. Again, not very surprising in this uh, we know before. Uh, but I think this is at least I know in insects like uh, are trying to use 3D, uh, plus also doing the broad sweep uh, uh, across uh, across a macro scale to capture uh, the broad scale patterns. Uh, surprising thing, after doing so much effort, we see such strong uh, phylogenetic structuring of these residuals, uh, and we, if we actually capture uh, 
what it means is so like, for example, there's one of the metric which tells you, say, if, the, if it's zero, then the trait is basically, there is no phylogenetic information in the trait. And, and if the value is one, then you know, the trait is essentially evolving by Brownian motion, right? And it's like 0.96, it's like nothing is happening. And you can see, right, like some groups have big eyes and others have another big eyes, but there's nothing much happening. There's like a really, really strong uh, phylogenetic structure uh, uh, in the data. Uh, and then if we kind of like, Earlier hypothesis was that like the habitat might have a big impact uh, um, on, on whether you have big eyes or small eyes, uh, and we used uh, a kind of a simple proxy to calculate the forest index. I'm not going into that, but now I'm using the lidar data and the more land cover data to get uh, more robust estimates of uh, forest classification, habitat classification, and you see nothing happening. Uh, uh, it is not surprising, like given the given the the residual structuring you saw uh, across the phylogeny. Uh, anyways, very perplexing findings, uh, but, but I think it's still interesting in some sense. Uh, but what I'm trying to capture is like more eye surface area, right? But then I don't really know what's happening in terms of the facet number and the facet size. And that's interesting because there's a trade-off between sensitivity and resolution. Uh, and what I mean by that is, for example, say the D is how big your individual facet is, right? And that determines how much light actually enters uh, in, your, in your materia. Uh, and this delta phi is basically the angle between the two materials. So you can imagine that, like say, you can in either increase uh, your size of the face set, so you get more lighting, you increase the sensitivity, or you can decrease this delta phi angle, so you got more materials, so you can sample more, so that increases your resolution, right? But you can't optimize more, so you got this fixed eye surface area, and then, but then we don't know if two species can have same eye surface area, but they can modify their eye parameter, whether they can balance the trade off between uh, uh, between uh, the facet size and number of facets. So I think that will be really cool. But to do that, now we collected some fresh specimens across phylogeny again. And then we'll do synchrotron uh, uh, level imaging of those ones. So we get, uh, we can see the facets as well as the brain as well along with it. Uh, so yeah, a lot more challenges, again, for the segment in the data. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, this is what the, probably uh, this year we'll try to get those scans out and then see what it looks like later. Uh, so anyway, so this is kind of my vague idea on what I can do after talking with Maurice and a bunch of other people. Uh, perhaps people have told me that this might be actually a, a good way, uh, or at least I'm gonna try and then see if it could try and automatize uh, my measurements. And also, I was uh, we talked uh, we, we heard a bit about the infravis uh, uh, on, on the on the first day, uh, and then my idea was that like I was just approaching people because I, I didn't know how to navigate through this data, uh, and then they, and then, then they were thinking okay maybe can we do something in virtual reality? Uh, and we were actually putting our goggles that project them, and then our idea was to kind of you know play around with these models, and then see if we could do some segmentations. And now we have got like very very basic; it doesn't do anything. I hope this video plays. Let's see. Uh, but this is like a second screen. Can you can you help me more, yeah, please? Yeah. Please uh, make it all work. Share the screen. Yeah, if you can play. Can you make the screen? Yeah. So this is this is very bad. This is like a very bad prototype we have. But I hope this. I don't know if it's gonna do anything. This is like a fun project we are running in the background. Uh, so you can see we are kind of seeing this whole butterfly model through the through the uh, virtual reality glasses, uh, and that blob you see is kind of an eraser. So whatever is inside that blob, like if you press the button, then it kind of takes it away. <laughs> so then the idea was like, if you have a model, and then if you want to just say segment the head out, then it will be as easy as just like make this cut, take this away, and then you have oh, that, that's my sci-fi wish idea. Uh, but but it seems like it does something of that. So maybe we'll be able to uh, refine it at some point, and it may actually work. It may not work. I don't know. Uh, it's just running in the background as like a hobby project. So hopefully something comes out of it. Uh, anyway, yeah, I, I, yeah, th th that's it. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much for listening. Uh, happy to <laughs>